What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of The Bullpen. Today, I got a real treat for you guys, right? I got a badass, okay? This dude is anywhere from, and I'm, I'm not going to give too much away, but this dude was a professional snowboarder to now, you know, serial entrepreneur. I want to hear how the hell that happened, right? So I can't wait to dive in. Everyone perk up your ears. Get ready. Let me introduce our guest. Chris Naugel is the founder and CEO of The Money School. The Money School teaches you to be your own bank. I can't wait to dive into that, man. I know exactly where you're going to go with that, which helps you solve your own money problem by putting you back in control of your money. There's a lot to dive in with you, man, because that is a very short bio for someone who's done a lot of cool things. Like I just said, this man is a former professional snowboarder, right? You've got some crazy projects coming up, which we're going to dive into, fintech and, you know, like you know, family man. And we're just, we're just about to really dig deep and get, get to the cusp of what, what makes Chris now the man. Right. Tell me brother, that first and foremost, thanks for coming on the Thank bullpen. You. Thank you for having me. Can't on. wait to have you on Honor and just and learn privilege. from you, man. So what's your story, bro? How the hell do you get to this point? Right. Well, number one, how do you start your life, end up being a professional snowboarder and then end up going over like what? <laughs> The transition, like <laughs> that is that is completely opposite of the spectrum in, in a lot of ways, right? In some ways they're very similar, but just break it down for me. What's oh, your story, man. man? You know, the journey's been an exciting one and it yeah. started like so many others, a very right. simple upbringing. My dad was an alcoholic. My mom raised oh, really? me. It was a huge struggle. My dad was a, a good man, you know, mm -hmm. but you know, just wasn't struggled. really part of my life. He did, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and now he's not. Now yeah. he's still around. He's not an alcoholic anymore. So oh, good kudos for him. to him. We're just not yeah. as close as we should be. But mom raised me mm -hmm. and- in the upbringing, my mom taught me to be a dreamer. She didn't have money. I mean, we grew up in a 700-square-foot, two-bedroom house, and there just wasn't extra money. So when I wanted things, a skateboard, a BMX, a dirt bike, like all I could do mm. is just envision them, draw them, and then just keep manifesting them. Mm. Now, I know how that works today. You know, you've heard yeah. it from Napoleon Hill. If you oh, dream yeah. it, you believe it, you can mm. achieve it. I yeah. have no idea. I'm just a kid, yeah. and I couldn't have the thing, so i draw them on paper. Mm. Well, all of those things happened. And, you know, it's unique, but the way that they happened wasn't the way that it happens for most kids. It was delayed gratification to the extent. And I remember, we'll just go into just a couple quick stories. There was one particular situation that really was interesting. When my mom wanted something, she would save her spare change. And I watched this vividly. I mean, it's, it's seared in my mind. She would come home and put her spare change in this glass jar in her, in her closet. And I'd watch this thing build up. And when it was time, she'd call me in and we'd sit down on her floor and we'd just roll the change. Now, yeah. I know people don't even know what that is anymore. <laughs> but back then, it was a fun thing. Yeah. And I just loved watching over time how this money built up. And then when she saved enough, she would buy it. Mm. It was so fascinating to me that one day she brought me home this little black box. I still have it, a little slide top. And it was so that when I made money or when I worked for money, I would save that. The first thing I was going to save for was a KX125. As a kid, it was always my, my passion. What bike. is that? A KX125 oh, a dirt bike. A dirt bike. Oh, a bike. Okay, dirt gotcha. Bike. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I started saving, and, you know, time went by, and one day my mom comes to me, and she says, hey, Chris, let's go over to Hebler's, the dirt bike shop, and let's let's look at that bike. Mm. And I'm like, oh, gosh, yeah, let's go. Mm. So we went there, and I rode them, and I thought it was over. It was, like, the best day of my life. And she says to me, she says, would you like that? That's all she said. And I'm like, uh, I was confused, but I'm like, of course I would. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, she says, well, you've saved enough money. Let's take it home. Dude, the, the, the feeling I felt at that moment was yeah. just pride and just accomplishment. Mm. That was my first experience with really saving. And she, you know, she put something in me, which changed the rest of my life. And I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. But going past that, you know, as I grew up, I was a skateboard kid. I was a snowboarder. Mm -hmm. And I come from Buffalo, New York. It's not the Mecca. Yeah. Like out here, we're in Salt But there's a lot of snow there. There's a lot of snow. Yeah. But we have 600, you know, 600 vertical feet hills. Yeah. Nothing like 11,000 feet. Here. Yeah, right. So the, when I told people what my goal was to be a pro snowboarder, they always would laugh at me. Uh -huh. And I just kept doing what everybody else was unwilling to do. I'm, I'll never forget. Couldn't afford to go to the hill because it cost money to get there and the mm. passes. So we had a country club by my mom's house. Mm. She would drive me there after school, and it was it was in a ravine. Mm. And I remember out of the sand traps, I would build jumps. Now, I would <sighs> watch these VHS tapes of yeah. my favorite snowboarders, and I would drill their tricks. So I'd go there, I'd build the jump, and I'd run up and down the hill practicing until I mastered it. So when I actually got on a real hill, like I had a pretty good foundation, mm. but that's just what I did. I mean, when you don't have things, you have to get resourceful Yeah. and you know, we didn't have resources. So resourcefulness was all I had. Mm. So the pro snowboarding thing was just something that I never gave up on. Mm. Contrary to what everybody said, I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. 
Now, just like every kid, I had to get a job. And at 14, I worked on a farm, but at 16, I got a job at a restaurant. Mm. I mean, that was the path we took back then. Right, days. right. And the guy that owned the restaurant degraded me so badly that when one day I came in and I just had had enough, I mm. quit. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't just go home and say, Mom, I quit my job. So I came home and I said, Mom, I got a plan. Mm. I want to mm. open a clothing line called Fat Clothing Company, P-H-A-T. <laughs> We're going back to 1992 yeah. Yeah. You're here, You're fat. Folks. No, I didn't call yeah. you fat. It's P-H-A-T fat. Oh, yeah. that means you're cool. It was cool. There you go. See, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Half the audience might be too young to even be like, what the heck is that? Yeah. Uh, so I, I went to s the school teacher, who was my art teacher, Mr. Mahalski. He mm -hmm. printed the shirts for the school. So I went to him and I said, hey, Mr. Mahalski, can we print some shirts after school? And he helped me do it. He showed me how to make the screens, and that's where it all began. Mm. My very first company literally took form. It was just a DBA, but I was 16 years old. I, I literally, when I started, I was 15, but when I was 16 is when I made it a business. Mm. And all I would do is I'd print shirts. I'd sell them at high school. My friends would see me do this. They're like, hey, check this design out. I'm like, oh, let's make a shirt out of this. Then they were excited to sell it out of their backpack. So now I had a sales team. Had no idea. <laughs> you know, like most people today, they start a business because they want to make a lot of money. Yeah. Me, this was just fun. Yeah. And I started doing that. And with my snowboarding, I was traveling a lot, going mm -hmm. to these snowboard shops, on, you know, that put these events on. Mm -hmm. And I remember I, I would see these guys that ran these shops that were, you know, they were buying my clothes. And one day, this guy at the shop called Hard Pack, I was in there. We just did our deal. I sold him, I don't know, maybe two dozen shirts. And he says, let's go ride. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, when do you get off work? He's like, let's just go now. I'm like, wait a second, you can just leave? Yeah. Like, that was foreign to me. Yeah. I'm like, you know, I'm used to the things that we brought, we're brought up with. We work a regular, mm -hmm. you know, shift. And he just said, no, let's go right now. At that very moment, I knew what my next step was. I needed my own shop. Mm. So I came home and I needed $70,000 that mm. we penciled it all out. So I'm 17, I have no money, mm. and I need 70 grand. So what would you do? I just went around to all my family members and said, hey, can I have 70 grand? Can I borrow 70 grand? I mm. put this whole thing together. I did a business plan, went to a bunch of banks. Every person told me no. Right. My father said, no, I'll get you a job at the factory. You know, you can just work where I did. But the funniest thing in life is, you know, there's, there's, there's a path to success. Mm -hmm. Earl Nightingale talks about this in The Strangest Secret. Mm. He said, you know, if you took 125-year-olds and you ask them if they're going to be successful, 100% of them say yes. Mm. But fast forwarding to retirement age, only five of those 100-year optimistic 25-year-olds are even successful. Mm. So why? The question is always, why is mm. that? Five of them created their destiny. The other 95% conform to somebody else's failed realities. Oh, I like that. So the reason I bring that up is my dad, not he wasn't doing this to be mean right, or anything right. else. Is all he knew. But his path, mm. his generational wisdom he could give me was come get a job, yeah. work 30 years or yeah. 20 years, get a pension. Right. It wasn't my path. So I didn't yeah. conform, and that created a lot of tension in my life. After I heard no enough times, I almost gave up. Mm. My mother, who was always the person that was had my back, watched this happen. Mm. And I'll never forget the day she comes to me and she says, well, I had gone to a bank and they said, we'll give you the loan, but you need collateral. Mm. Listen, I'm 17. I don't even know what collateral is. Mm. I, I said, all right, when they told me, I'm like, all right, I got a 1986 Buick Skyhawk. Cool car by today's standards. <laughs> I got a KX125 dirt bike and I got a baseball card you know, collection. Mm -hmm. Do we got a deal? They said, no, son, we need a little something more. Mm. My mother put our house on the line. She literally had a house that had $72,000 worth of equity in it. And she got it in the divorce. Wow. She put her house on the line so her punk snowboard kid could get his start. Listen, like that is the ultimate level of giving and generosity. Yeah. And at that time, I didn't understand the magnitude of how important that would be in my life, but yeah. she did that and she took a huge chance on me. Yeah. So the next few years, I was we'll building talk about the accountability. store. Absolutely. Jeez. November of 1994 was the date. Mm -hmm. The store name is Fat Man Board Shops. The coolest thing, Future Pays, it's still open today. Really? Yeah. I, I sold it in 2010. You know, after the yeah. Great Recession, we'll mm -hmm. hit that. But the guy that I sold it to was an, a former uh, pro snowboarder mm -hmm. who I used to compete against. And mm -hmm. he bought it, and now he still runs it. It's really cool. It's a cool legacy. Mm -hmm. But back to that story is November 94, I opened this shop. I'm 17. So everything in my life changed because mm -hmm. everything came about survival. Mm -hmm. Man, I can't lose the house. I can't lose. I can't fail. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of times I would wonder, how am I going to get through that next day? Yeah. I mean, we've all had that in business. And mm -hmm. at 17, that's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. But I did. Mm -hmm. And I went on to run those shops. Everything was going great. Listen, it was like a fairy tale. I think back to those days, and I'm like, these were the best years of my life. Because mm -hmm. I was a pro snowboarder at this time. I had three shops open, and I'm, I'm fast forwarding into the 2000s. Three stores open, dude, it was, it was perfect. Didn't make a lot of money, but I was living 
the life. Mm. And then one day, I'm driving into the store, and on the radio, I heard that a plane hit a tower. And I'm like, well, that's weird. You know where I'm going. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then later I found out that was 9-11, mm. and that triggered the dot-com crash. Or, well, the dot-com crash was going to happen. In yeah, right, that's right. just the, mm -hmm. the mental thing I have. The black now, swan event, yeah. Right. And I, I'm, in, I'm in my early 20s, maybe mm -hmm. 22, 23 at this time. I'd never seen a recession. I didn't even know what that meant. Mm. But I knew that my store sales dropped, and I knew things got really tough. You know, forward past to now, that's an interesting parallel because right now, 2022, if you're 37 years old or younger, mm -hmm. you've never seen a recession. You've only seen strong bull markets and good times. Mm. So we're all in for an awakening, mm. but a lot of people are going to have that same feeling I did when it hits you when you have no idea. I had to get a job. Mm. So I went to Little Caesars, what any you know twenty year old would do to deliver pizzas, and they weren't hiring. Mm. So I put my resume out. Wait, wait, you're, so you're working at Little Caesars? No, I wasn't. Oh, okay. I, I was just working in my stores. But you're trying. But okay, so you got the shop, and yeah. you're still trying to get this little job for Little Caesars today. Because like, I needed money. Because the recession oh. dropped my sales so much, I couldn't oh, take a shit. paycheck. Yeah. And back then, my paycheck was like two hundred and fifty bucks a week, but right. I couldn't afford that anymore. Yeah. I was like, okay, pay for the the supplies and the, the merchandise, or uh, take two hundred and fifty bucks a week. Right. So I cut my salary. Yeah. That was a mistake too, but I didn't mm. know that. So I, I was just trying to get a job to pay, you know, pad the way and transition yep. through this. Mm. When I put my resume out, the funniest thing happened. The only people that called me back were Wall Street firms. So picture this. I'm a pro snowboarder. I wear beanies and hoodies. We kind of talked about that, and thank you for the, the hoodie you gave yeah, me. Yeah, you bet. That's all I wore. Now, all of a sudden, I got an interview at a Wall Street firm. Now, I got to show up in a suit. <laughs> Grandma, I need your help. I've yeah. never put a suit on, and I don't know how to tie a tie. So she gets me my suit and a zip-up tie, and off I go. And I'll never forget that interview. The dude was like this pompous Wall Street kind of guy, slides his Porsche keys down the table. Later, I learned that was from Boiler Room, but slides the keys <laughs> down the table and says, if you work at this firm, you can have one of these. I'm like, sign me up. Yeah. That was my entry into Wall Street. Mm. So I was 23 years old, and I started in the middle, right in that little bullpen. And mm -hmm. it's kind of funny because this is bullpen, and bullpen. that was the bullpen. Yeah, that's right. The, the interesting thing about that is when – you know, I went from being a pro snowboarder, never putting a suit on, to now I got to wear a suit every single day. Mm -hmm. Dude, that messes with your head. Yeah, It's a complete dynamic shift, and I wasn't ready for mm -hmm. it. To do it, I literally had to go to one of my suppliers, Volcom, and I had to, they, they sold suits. I ordered three suits, a black one, a gray one, and a blue one. The only Volcom? three colors. Volcom. Oh. You didn't know they made suits? No. I didn't either. Okay. But I had a shop, so I found that out pretty quick. I huh. saw that their athletes were, you know, when they'd have like these rider poles and everything, they wore suits. And I'm mm. like, I got to get one. Mm. My rep got me three suits, and that's how I did it, man. I went to work in a Volcom suit so that mentally I felt connected to who I really mm. was, a snowboarder. But now I'm in Wall Street. Yeah. And in that bullpen, I learned something. You know, I was there to make money and I was there to learn. Mm. But I kept looking at those outside glass offices around the edge. You've all seen the movies. It's right. no different in yeah. almost every firm. And I remember looking at them saying, how do I get one of those offices? Well, I watched these guys that made a lot of money come in at 830. They go to a two hour lunch and 430 in the afternoon, dude, they're gone. Mm. So all I had to do was do everything they were unwilling to do. Mm. And I did. I got it there at 7. I worked through lunch, made calls, and those calls I made during lunch, I went out and I saw them at kitchen tables after everybody was gone. Mm -hmm. And I became one of the top advisors. And that takes me all the way to 2008. I was crushing it. Mm -hmm. I made 74 grand my first year. By today's standards, may not be a lot, but that was the most I'd ever made. Yeah. And I flipped two houses in the midst of that, 2006 mm -hmm. and 2007. So I got my feet wet in the real estate world. Yeah. And then 2008, my lease came due mm -hmm. in my biggest fat man store. And there was a building, two buildings down. It was a dilapidated paint store. So I called the guy and I said, you know, how much are you asking? We negotiated. And then I put it under contract. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the money. It was like 370 grand. I didn't have that. Mm. So I found some guys, probably not the right kind of guys. You, mm. You've met these people that were willing to give me the money. Mm. So they did. They gave me 370. And they were willing to give you 370,000 bucks. Hard money loan, 15%. Uh, I'll never forget that moment signing those contracts, being like, oh man, what am I doing? Yeah. But that isn't the, 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 the scariest part is not that I just borrowed 370,000 bucks from a group that you know, if I didn't pay them, probably wouldn't just take the property. They'd yeah. probably take a little bit more. Right. The problem was the Great Recession kicked in right then and there in that winter. Mm. Dude, it hit me like a Mack truck. Yeah. It was one of the most difficult periods of time and the hardest things to realize because everything I had built, 
the Wall Street world just shut down. Mm -hmm. Okay, my <clears throat> stores. That was Christmas time when I realized this. The, the sales were down forty percent. I couldn't even pay my bills. Mm. And I remember I had exhausted all the money that I had, taken loans from my 401k. I took all the loans I had in my, my whole life policies. Everything was out. And I was one payment away mm. from bankruptcy. Mm. Come home. My girlfriend, this mm. prized token girl, had just moved into my house. And I sat her down and I said, sweetie, I need your help. Mm. I need your help paying the mortgage. I need your help paying the utilities. And my friend Pete's going to move into that bedroom over there. And almost, almost as if I should have finished that by saying, any questions? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's right. like, well, who am I, right? I, I'm nobody. And I had probably a 10% chance of her sticking around, but mm. we're still, we're married now. We've been married 14 years, so mm. I guess she kind of liked me. Congrats. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a hard time, but we made it through mm -hmm. barely. And 2009 to 14 was the next phase, mm. and that was what I call the real estate phase. It's when I took everything I had. And I just did what Warren Buffett said, buy low. Mm. Real estate was cheap. And all my wealthiest clients yeah. that I managed were in real estate. That's right. So I started buying real estate. Mm. And I got up to 36 units by 2014. Took the 37th unit to the bank. And they said no. Mm. Uh, listen, we learn things the hard way sometimes. I, I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't have coaches. I just went about it thinking I knew what I didn't know. Mm. And I always quote uh, Will Rogers. You're familiar with him, right? I, I don't think so. Well, Will Rogers says this. He says, the biggest problem in America is not what we don't know. The biggest problem is what we think we know that just ain't mm. so. So I thought I knew what I didn't know. Mm. That bank said no. Then they froze my lines of credit. I didn't know this. I was borrowing in my personal name, not a company name. Mm -hmm. And I hit my debt to income ratio. Right. So they wouldn't lend anymore. But then they, 37 properties. Yeah. Damn, that's... It, well, it wasn't... No, it was 37 doors. Oh, so yeah, I, yeah. it was probably eight or nine properties. I was going to say, damn, dude. No, like, no, no, that no, didn't no. come. Like, think, you were crushing. I think... No, I Ooh. definitely wasn't. So 37 doors. <laughs> okay, yeah. I was like... I always count the doors. Not yeah. The, yeah. No, but, I get you. So I think it was like nine properties that I had. Mm -hmm. And then they froze that line of credit. That was it. I didn't know it. And I thought, oh, I can make it. But I couldn't get the units renovated, and a spiral happened. Everything just spiraled out of control. Mm. I ended up having to sell all the properties. The dream house that me and Larissa bought, 171 Radcliffe, we had to sell that. Mm. I'll never forget that moment. Larissa had left. Like, we split because times like that, you know, it's yeah. just hard, hard to hold things together. Mm. And I'm sitting in the bedroom of this house that was, you know, already sold. Mm. And I'm looking at my bedroom set, which I listed on Craigslist. And the folks walked in to take it, and I watched my bed walk out the house. Mm. I mean, that's when you, that's when you realize you hit bottom mm. and, uh, that's what I did, man. Mm. It was, uh, one of those things where I wasn't ready for it. I thought I had the ego, you know, wall street, you know, I was making good money and now all of a sudden it just got completely wrecked. Yeah. The next phase was basically pity and blaming and blaming everybody and mm. just self, you know, sabotage really. Yeah. But a uh, postcard comes in the mail, and it said, come to this seminar to learn how to flip houses. Mm. You know, and it was actually a company from out here. Mm. You, you know the company, or maybe you didn't. What's the, uh, what's the company name? It was Zurich. Oh, I don't think I Okay, yeah, they're, they're no more, but okay. yeah, we'll call that out. So this postcard said, come to this thing to flip houses. I, I didn't want to, but I flip it over. And on the back, it said, if you come, you get a free iPod shuffle. <laughs> Jeremiah, I had nothing to lose, yeah. but now I had an iPod shuffle to gain. Mm. So I went to the thing, and yeah. I met two guys, okay, Mike and Greg. They spoke at the front, and they spoke about money. So I was instantly attached. Right. And when they were speaking about money, it was the total opposite thing mm. of everything I'd been taught in Wall Street. You know, traditional financial knowledge, and these guys are really wealthy real estate investors, and mm -hmm. they're they're using money a different. They're playing a different game. Yeah. So I was instantly like, I gotta, I gotta learn this game. Mm. So I swiped my credit card, paid for three thousand dollar event, came home, told my my she was my fiance then because mm. we had gotten back together, and uh, she was pissed. <laughs> She's like, you spent how much? Mm -hmm. And you want me to take a Friday off of work to go to this stupid thing that you you think is going to change our life? And I yeah. said, uh, yeah, duh. So she did go, and it really did change her life. So we mm -hmm. went on. The next thing after that is it was tough, but we did, we flipped 271 houses today. Wow, jeez. Yeah, a lot. We got a show on HGTV in 2018 called Risky Builders. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so we didn't go on to a series. We, we piloted. We aired six, I think it was six times, six or seven, uh -huh. and then Discovery bought HGTV, and that was it. Uh -huh. But, and I'll never forget that call. Holy crap. I, I guess I'll tell that. I don't ever say this, but I was driving home from one yeah. of the flips. The phone rings and I see it right away. It's my producer. And I was so excited. I'm yeah. like, oh, dude, here we go. We got yeah, it. Right. Pick it up. Super. Hey, what's going on? But the voice on the other end wasn't my excitement. It was, hey, I got some bad news. Mm. Instantly I knew. Yeah. This, you know, HGTV decided not to take you on to the series. And I was like, Why? Well, they're not doing any new shows because Discovery has just froze all new shows, and unfortunately, you got you know tied up in that. I'm sorry, mm. that was it. Damn. 
So that's one of those moments where you literally burned the boats because at that point, I had left Wall Street. I sold my practice because they really didn't want me. They didn't want me in that business, to be honest, because I wanted an OBA. And they said, no, we're not doing a TV show person. So you either got to decide, kid, you can be an advisor or a TV show star. Mm. See ya. Yeah. So all the boats were burned. And this call mm. just was the final straw. Yeah. Like I just lost the battle. So I'm like, do I just jerk the wheel of this truck into a tree and see what happens? Mm. I did. I went home and told my wife and we handled it. But my phone rang and it was that Greg guy I told you from that event. We yeah, had right. been doing some business and we were partnering in some private funds that we were doing. And he was super excited. And I thought, he's just trying to cheer me up. Mm. Like he's calling me because somebody tipped him off, told him we didn't get the show. And it wasn't. He was just excited. So in life, sometimes a door closes so that another one can open. Mm. But at that very moment, you don't think that way. Mm -hmm. And that led me to where I'm at today, where I just get to go around and I teach people all the secrets of the wealthy that mm. I've learned, which mm. is the opposite of what I learned in Wall Street. Mm. And I just teach people how to be a good steward of their money. Man, we're going to get into that then. Yeah. Jeez. So that's, that's, I know it's a long, little drawn out <laughs> story, but it's uh, that's the path I've been on. And the there's journey's a, beginning. Dude, yeah, seriously, there is a lot to unpack there. Let me let me actually go way back actually because i like there's so much to unpack here in this story but what actually really kind of hit me was at first was you know talking about how you grew up right it's been fascinating to see all these really successful people sit where you sit at, at in this podcast in this room right and how many of them have a, a story of where they grew up in poverty which is fascinating to me because i've heard something along the lines of where they say if you grow up in um you know in wealth it's almost a disadvantage but then other people argue it is an advantage because then you immediately learn just how to do things and you just have this belief in yourself so there's this battle back and forth that i've actually heard of some people will say you know if you're born into wealth then you're going to learn wealth right you just see that as is and this is your expectation for life is that this is what i do this is what our family does right and you almost just have that mentality and expectation right and there's there's no learning curve. You're going to just kind of absorb, right? But then there's the other side of where they say it's an advantage to grow up in poverty because what you said is the grind, the hustle, right? The dreams. And I, I want to touch on that. But at first, I'm actually, before I touch on that, I want to ask your opinion. Obviously, from your perspective, what do you think about that? That Because I've heard both. So tell me what your thoughts are. I would agree that it can go both ways, but it really isn't so much about whether you grow up with money or you grow up without money. It's really what you're taught about money. Mm. You know, even if you grow up with money, it doesn't mean you're going to be happy. It doesn't mean life's going to be easy. I know a lot of extremely wealthy people that are the most miserable sons of pups I've ever met. True. But then I know people that have nothing that are just grateful for every single day. So I think it's more of a mindset than it is what you have or mm. what you don't have yeah. because it's just your upbringing. Yeah. You know, we, we get our knowledge and, and knowledge is passed down from generation to generation. And in that past, a lot of things are lost. The transfer loses knowledge, like mm -hmm. the, like that game telephone back when we were young. Yeah, right. You know, you lose this. And I yeah. think when it comes to wealth and money, I think that's one of the biggest gaps. Mm -hmm. And I think society really has done a terrible job of oh. passing generational knowledge of wealth. I and personally money believe that's down. on purpose, especially with the school system. One hundred percent. We'll on touch purpose. on that, but I 100%. believe that's pur on purpose. Yeah, and that pisses me off. So me too. Well, well, it'll get interesting once we hit that one. School uh, sucks. That's that's just like putting a knife in me. You yeah, know, it's school's awful. Yeah, and the entire system is awful. But you got to understand I why agree. it is yeah. that way. It's For not a reason by by design. Yeah. But I think I think growing up without money mm. for me. I can only speak to me. Okay. It gave me the ability to dream and it, it allowed me to understand delayed gratification mm. and it allowed me to understand the feeling because mm. it's always just a feeling of when you actually work hard and mm. accomplish something. Mm. And I think nothing's changed since then. Yeah. You know, I, I try not to ever just splurge. You know, I try not to act on emotion. I try to act on pure logic these mm. days. It's very difficult in this world because you want uh, the new car, the yeah. new shirt, the mm. new shoes. But if you just delay that yeah. and you work toward it, we set goals in my household. Now, my daughter's two years old. She's the single greatest thing that's ever happened. Mm -hmm. But she's also my greatest opportunity in life as well. Mm. Because I often think, based on what you just said, I often think about this a lot, man. I stay up late thinking about this. If I could go back and change one thing, what would it be? And I think it would be I would probably rethink money. I would rethink how money works. Mm. But we can't go back in time. Right. We can't change anything. Right. We are who we are because of the way we're brought up. Mm -hmm. But 
the cool part now that I have a daughter mm. is I don't have to think about going back in time because my single greatest legacy, which mm. is my daughter, mm -hmm. is my greatest opportunity. So I get to share everything I've learned with her. And if I just grew up with money and all these things and anything I wanted, I, what would I pass on to her? Mm. The struggle is the story. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's just how I feel. I think no, the yeah. ability to dream and, and want things yeah. is very important. I mean, that, that's 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 a key what I heard from you describing it is that it's almost the advantage of you learn to dream about things, right? You learn to th see things that you want and you know you ain't going to get it unless you do something different. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's where I see, I'm listening to, you know, like there's no chance you're going to have it unless you do something about it, right? Because in this perspective, if you want something, a lot of times you can have it. You know, if you're raised with wealth, so it almost destroys the ability to dream because what do I need to dream for? Sure. You know, it almost gets rid of that. And I'm not saying it gets rid of it completely, but it almost, I guess it won't almost minimize the ability, like you're saying, to dream and just like go to bed at night and dreaming about something and you can't wait to wake up and work for that thing, right? Which you're talking about the bike, right. you know? And all of a sudden when you do accomplish that thing, it's like, holy shit, right? Like I did it, you know? So that's an interesting perspective. But also the second one I'd say is resourcefulness. Yes, very Right? Much. Because on one side, you don't have to be nearly as resourceful, right? I suppose on this side, you have to be very resourceful. You have If you're going to get something that you really want, you have to find any way possible to get that done, whether it's, hell, taking shark money loans <laughs> or whether it's, you know, going out and uh, trying to sell pizzas while you're, you know, out of flipping it. Like, well, you have, just have to be really resourceful in order to make it happen. Right, which is why a lot of people don't make it happen in that situation. They stay there because they don't see the potential or they don't believe in themselves enough to be resourceful enough to go do that. Right? Yeah, so if they don't have the, that mentality like you're talking about, they're not going to get out of that situation ever. That's going to be where they stay forever. You know? you know, I love it. You know, like when I was in, you know, when I was an advisor, one of the big things when I'd meet with clients, I was a young advisor. Yeah. So they were always like, so where'd you go to school? And I always felt embarrassed. Yeah. I'm like, oh, here we go. Well, I went to a community college yeah. for two years for business right. ownership and management. And I was embarrassed to say that. Yeah. But you know what? That's probably one of my greatest attributes mm. because I didn't go to college to learn what I wanted to do. Yeah. I was already doing what I wanted to do. Yeah. So when I went to school or trade schools, I was learning something that was applied immediately. Because what is knowledge if it's not applied? Mm. It's useless. Yeah. Every bit of knowledge I had through high school, like from Mr. Mahalski's class mm. to my bookkeeper or my accounting class to my business law class, I remember all those teachers. You know why? Mm. Everything they taught me was applied immediately. Mm. I'd learn it in, in high school. I'd go home into that basement yeah. and I would literally have debit and credit, big accounting pads. And yeah. I was like doing what my teacher just taught me. Right. So my learning curve was escalated because everything was applicable at that very moment. Mm. So with or without college, college might've actually been a hindrance for me Yeah. because it would have taught me what they want me to know, not mm -hmm. what I needed to know. I think college... I think college should switch to be more of a trade school thing. Because of course I want my doctor to go to college. Of course I yeah, want heart surgery yeah, might be a good idea. I to go to you know, and I don't think anyone's gonna argue with that. Like, yes, we want our doctors to go get the trade school. But you know, that's the that's things like but the fact that you have to go through school first before you can become a doctor. You have to go through four years of schooling, meaning you do all the things. If you look at school as a business structure, the longer you can keep them in school, the more money you make. That's true. It's not a nonprofit, man. It's not a nonprofit. These, these, these things make a lot of money, right? These universities. And so when you talk about schools, I think it, we'd have more success. We'd actually have, I think if we got rid of the whole idea of school and rethought it just to trade schools, Right. So if you're going to be an attorney, you go to attorney school. Yep. You're not here learning about, you know, like all this other bullshit of what the, you know, you have to take this many social studies, uh, you know, credits. And then over here, we want you to make sure you're, you know, uh, doing, you know, some English class. It's like, no, no, and no. Don't forget to go to bowling class. <laughs> yeah. Like, don't forget to take, a, have to take an elective that yeah. you have to pay for, you know, like the bullshit, right? It's money, right? It's money 100%. that they're pulling in. And so for me, I'm like, well, how much better would we be if you just focused on your, you know, your trade, your skills? And that's where it comes with why I say trade, because it's skill sets. When you develop skill sets, you develop successful habits. You develop something that stays with you forever. Absolutely. Right? This bullshit that we got in here, develop the skill sets. And you could go to multiple trade schools and develop all these skill sets. That would be so much more valuable than the fucking way we have it set up. And we could probably talk about this for uh, hours. Dude, listen, that was my path. Because yeah. when I, you know, like being an advisor, I went to a lot of trade schools to learn 
certain certifications that I had as an right. advisor. And being an entrepreneur, I went to you know different business trade schools to learn how to do different things that I didn't know how to. Yeah. And all those things were things I needed to advance what I was doing. Yeah. Not things I needed to get a degree in mm -hmm. something that maybe I was gonna do or maybe I wasn't. You know, you talk to people all the time, they get this crazy degree and they don't even do anything with right. it. It's crazy. And you know what the best thing is like, and this is more for entrepreneurs. Again, doctors, engineers, mm -hmm. you know, they, they need school. Right. But an entrepreneur, you know what we need? A row of buttons like Henry Ford. Yeah. We need smarter people that know the things we need. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be good at certain things. I got people like Randy Garn on a button, right? He's yeah. my mentor. I, and we both know him well. I push that button mm -hmm. and I got somebody that's got a crazy like I he's believe a stud. School. he's a stud already. Yeah, shout out to got, Randy Garn, man. Yeah, I got one of those. I got Troy, you know, who's built hundred million dollar companies. I push that button. Yeah. CPAs, attorneys, like that row of buttons. I've learned is far more valuable than me knowing everything mm -hmm. because I've only got 24 hours in the day and yep. I've got so few of them to trade yeah. that I don't want to be an expert in anything. Right. I want to be an expert in one or two things. And that's what I, that's what I built my entire business on yeah. being an expert in two things. Yeah. Only. Right. Well, okay. Now let's, let's fast forward to today. We're here and you have the money school, right? Mm -hmm. Teaching the laws of wealthy. I can't wait. I, 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 very confident that what I'm about to hear has a lot to do with what I've been trying to preach for the last few years. So I, I'm just can't wait for this. Okay. So, okay. Talk me through it. Right. The money, money school, what you've got going here. What are the secrets of wealthy? Break it down for us. All right. Us. So really it goes back to, you know, if you've ever read the book, the richest man in Babylon, mm -hmm. it lays a lot of the foundations of the back. It was the principles of, of, or the rules of uh, gold, I think is what mm -hmm. they call it. So I've taken that book and I've read it probably 20 times mm. and I've read lots of other books and I've developed the six laws of wealth. Mm. They're very simple. So let me just rattle them off for your audience. The first law of wealth is the, only, this is the single most important one. My mom taught me this. You got to save 10% of the money you earn. Whatever your gross income is, save it. The way I'm teaching my daughter is I'm going to teach her that by every $10 she gets. I don't care if it's an allowance, however she gets it, she must keep $1. She's got to learn to pay herself first. Remember I said I stopped mm -hmm. paying myself mm -hmm. in the business yeah. because I had bills to pay? That's right. wrong. We're cheating ourselves. Yeah. First law of wealth, save one-tenth of the money right. you earn. Yeah. Second law of wealth only comes when you master the first law. Yeah. Your money has to work for you. Yeah. There's 24 hours in the day. Yeah. We can only trade so many of them for money, right? And that's what we've been taught to do. Society will teach you hustle, work, trade hours for dollars. Your do your hours are priceless. Yeah. You can make more dollars, but you can't make more time. Amen. So why do we learn that? Mm. We got to change it. The wealthy don't do that. The wealthy make money work for them. And mm. so do you and you know all the people we surround ourselves. They know how to make money work for them. So right. the second law of wealth, learn how to make your money go out and work for you. Because mm. your money doesn't have limits like we do. Mm. Third law of wealth, the most violated law right now is protect your wealth. Mm. I always joke around, Ricky Ricky Bobby and Talladega Nights. Yeah. Like, you're a car guy. His father, when he got kicked out of the school, looks back at him and he says, son, just remember this. If you're not first, you're last. You're last. Well, I'm a big private lender and I'm yep. always first, man. Mm -hmm. But protect your wealth. Don't invest in things you don't know, like, and understand. Mm. And never invest your money with somebody that, you, that doesn't have knowledge through time, wisdom, and failure. Mm -hmm. I see this. There's gurus all over social media. Mm -hmm. I'm an expert. I made all this money. You've never failed. Why would I, why would I ever trust what you say? You don't even know the other side, but you're going to learn. Hmm. Well, a lot of those crypto guys did learn pretty good lessons, <laughs> but so that's the third law of wealth. Protect yeah. your wealth by investing in things, you know, like, and understand yeah. the fourth, s never, ever, ever seek unrealistic returns or your money will flee. You, uh. you got to be realistic. You can't be greedy because if you're greedy, money will flee. And, and yeah. I've had that happen a right. lot of times. So that's the fourth law. Mm. The fifth is, is not about money. It's about the most important thing. We have to live a life where we solve other people's problems. Mm. Everything we do when we come to work, we should be focused on what problem am I, am I solving for mm. someone else? There's not a company in the world that doesn't do just that. They solve problems for mm -hmm. people and they find bigger problems or more of them to solve. Mm. So that's what we need to do. We need to give unconditionally by solving other people's problems. Mm. The sixth law of wealth goes back to the one thing that we all need to focus on every day, mm. and that's legacy. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people have confused legacy. I think society's taught us legacy is about the things we leave. Oh, the car, the money, the house, the things we leave is a legacy. No, it's about the things you did to change people's lives. Because mm. when everybody's sitting around that casket that really is nothing more than a, a corpus of your your body, you're off in heaven. That's right. When you are s sitting there or you're in heaven looking down, 
What are those people saying about you? What do they remember? Mm. I guarantee it's not the Lambo. I guarantee it's not the money in the bank. It's not the fancy houses. Mm -hmm. It's the way you treated other people and what Mm. you did for them. Those are the six laws of wealth. Mm. And I'm instilling those laws in a very different way in my daughter. My daughter is never going to know anything but those six laws. Mark my word, that will be my single greatest Mm. legacy I leave. Those are good. I like those. Number one, one of those, so I say this all the time. When I teach sales, my number one thing I tell, tell everyone in sales is say, throw out your fucking scripts and learn how to solve problems. Dude, that's all you need. That's all business is. All business is learning how to solve problems in the world. And I say, this is what I say. I, t- I tell people, I say, the world will pay you exactly what it thinks you're worth. And the, the amount of problems that you can solve is directly correlated to how valuable you are to the world, right? They don't care about your desires and hopes and dreams. They care about how can you help my problems. Maybe that's a selfish mindset for them, but that's too fucking bad because that's how the way the world works, right? Love it, man. Can you solve their problems? If you can, they will pay you for it. As a matter of fact, people don't really care about money. They care about what money can do for you. Absolutely. And if they can solve their problems, then they're very willing to spend that money. As a matter of fact, if people want to appear more wealthy, they are much more willing to spend three thousand dollars on a fucking bag at Louis Vuitton because that solves that problem for them. Do you like? You imagine trying to go to somebody and convince them to buy a purse for three thousand dollars just based on you know the the parts of the of the bag? It ain't gonna happen. It's just the fucking logo that provides that value. That's all that matters, right? So what you just said is. Part, it's exactly it. If your business isn't solving problems, you don't got a business. That's right. Right? You don't got a business. And honestly, business is a game of people. You know? That's all it is. It's other people's money. Is I can't I don't have a business if I just stand here. I need I have a business if I have other people paying me with their money. So that means the business I'm in is you and me, is me and him. It's people. So if I ain't good with people and I ain't good at working with them, I suck. That's right. <laughs> right. You know, you get into all the, and I, you know, I've, I've fell into this trap many times of like the funnels and the copy and the scripts and this is this and all the details and the marketing strategy. And then, you know, if you have I've got so caught up in that before where it's like, well, fuck, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not that important. If you really take a perspective, just are you providing value? That's it. Cost is only an issue in the absence of value. Dude, I, le- I learned that a long time ago. Yeah. And I argue that every day because of what I do with teaching people how to be their own bank. And, you know, mm. it's interesting, like, when you talk about solving a problem, like, think through your life and your audience. Like, everybody that's watching this, I want you to think about the one time in your life when you focused on your problems. Mm. You know? Boo hoo this. Oh my God, that. I don't Every have this day. car. I can't pay my bills. This, your problems. You start, yeah. you start projecting that. Mm. What happened next? I get, I can tell you exactly what happened. You failed. You got harder times. Things got worse, didn't they? They didn't get better. It's because you were solving the wrong problem. You were trying to solve your own problem and you go out and you make bad decisions. You focus on all the wrong things with what you're doing. But then if you just flip the switch and you say, oh, you know what? My problems are my problems. Yeah. They'll get solved in time. Let me solve your problem. Mm. And then you focus solely on that. All your heart, all your passion has to go into that. Like you talk about social media. Like, you know this. Like, we can spend all this time calculating and building the best funnel with the best product. But you know what? It's always the video that you think is going to do the worst. That's authentic. That's just you there just pouring your heart out and telling people how you really care about them. That one goes viral. And you spent no money on it. You just sat there in front of your phone. You said, man, this this is how it is. And this is what I'm doing. Amen. That's exactly right. Um, I'm going to say one more thing before I ask you the last, not us, I got one more question for you specifically on like that, that education stuff. But one thing is you're talking about is all this stuff you've learned over time. You were mentioning how, you know, what you said, I forgot how you phrase it, but like that, that information that you don't know or something. Well, I don't forget. Yeah, the biggest problem in America is not what we don't know. It's what we think we know that just ain't so. That's yeah, that's love, Will Rogers. I, I love that because what I always say to people is, and I actually don't even know where this came from. I just been saying it. I think I heard something like this once and I said, the most dangerous information is the information you don't know. Bingo. Right? That's the only thing that can hurt you. You know what's so funny is there's more information available today than any other time in history. And yet there seems to be more problems. <laughs> because we're not applying the information. No. We're just expecting everything to be handed to us because yes. there's so much information. Yeah. And we absorb all this and it all comes in. But we do a terrible job yeah. of teaching our children. Now we can get into the school thing. But yes. We do a terrible job of teaching one simple fundamental that our yeah. ancestors knew well. Yeah. And that was apply. Yes. 
Learn something and go apply it. Yeah. If it doesn't, inv- like, if it's not going to get you where you want to be on your journey, uh-huh. ignore it. Well, if they didn't apply Throw it, it back then, they died. That's correct. <laughs> they didn't eat. Their families died. Right. Like, there was a lot on the line. Fly. Yeah. Nowadays, it's just it, everything's coming at you a million miles a minute. And it's have, hard to determine what's right and what's wrong. Damn straight. We have made life so easy to just exist mm-hmm. and survive. It's easy. As a matter of fact, like, that's, what, that's what's fascinating to me about our day and age is it's easy to survive. It's easy to exist. And if you just exist, you have wasted your life. Because if you're just existing, you're basically just leeching off the world and its energy and, and the food that's here. Why don't you go do something with your Create. life? Remember I said exactly. Earl yes. The difference between success and failure is what? Create. Create. That's right. Create your destiny. Create your dream. Yep. Create your future life. Don't Legacy. conform. Yeah. Conformity. It's sick what's happening in the world today. Yeah. It's a conforming world. And right. that's the reason why so few people are getting what they want out because they're just expecting everything to happen and yeah. they're conforming to other people's failed dreams, failed realities, and failed plan. Amen. That's uh, sick. And it's yeah. 95% of the mm-hmm. population. So folks, if you're the 5% Kudos. You're the 95%. Man, we got some work to Man, do. Man, you're a lot more optimistic than I am because to me, it's 99%. The one per, you know, like you, we know you he's might gonna, be right. I'm it, going off social security you are. statistics. <laughs> no, so. I'm just, it, it is, it is fascinating just to listen to people's bullshit, right? And you just, oh, there's you, a lot of bullshit. Oh, it, it, you know, and you can't, you can't, you can smell the bullshit a lot better when you've been through the shit, right? right? We're all eating a shit sandwich here, right? And that's like, this world sucks. It's it's a brutal place. It, it and that's just it's never going to stop being a brutal place. It's an unforgiving world. It is. It, there's evil that exists here. And it's never going to go away. So if you if evil will never go away, if the bad shit will never go away, that means in order to avoid it, you can't. So you have to be strong enough to overcome it. That's the only option, or it'll swallow you up, and it's all its you know fangs, and it's it's complete hell, right? And I w- and I know we couldn't talk about school like. I hated school, right? For multiple reasons. I hated school with all my heart. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs hate school because they're driven and they have something bigger and then they have some teacher telling them to focus, to sit down, to not think about that, to think about this. And you're just sitting here asking like, why? Right, why? And you're talking about Napoleon Hill. It's the people who have the ability to freely think for themselves. If you can freely think for themselves, you're free. That's what freedom is is you own your own mind. You are the master of your fate. And we, we, you know, we can talk about Victor Frankl and, you know, Nelson Mandela and their discoveries on freedom. True freedom is in the mind. And when it's in the mind, then you realize that no one has control over you and your emotions and your the outcome of your life. That's when freedom happens. But slavery happens when they've overcome your mind and told you to conform. It's happening right now. It's happening right now. Worse than ever. Ever. It's crazy. Like what Hitler did was nothing compared to what they're doing right now. And I don't even mean to bring Hitler up. I'm not like giving any credit to him. Uh-huh. Like it was terrible. But right. this is the same playbook, man. T- tell me why do you th- why he said that? Because let's be honest, that's a bold statement, control. right? He had mind control. Okay. He taught people to believe something that wasn't real, but he set an agenda and he literally had people believe it. And it was sick what happened next. Mm. The same damn thing's happening today. I don't know how people can't see that. Yeah. Oh, I, I, that's, uh, and wow. until we get off this yeah. rat race and we start literally, like, when it all, it all comes down to money. You know, mm. and when I say that word money, yeah. everybody that's watching this has a different feeling. But it's no different. Like, if I say the word mom. Yeah. How do you feel? Love. How do you feel? Dentist. How do you feel? <laughs> Colonoscopy. Some people got a weird feeling on that one. <laughs> or but a good every feeling. Every one of those give you a different feeling because yeah. of how we were brought up. We yeah. had different parents, different teachers, different schools, different religions. Everything was different. Yeah. But our path can be the same, but we got to change it. Mm. We got to stop, stop giving up control of the one thing, the tool that does control it all. And this is the one way that they control it. I don't care if it was back, you know, in Germany or today. Money. Amen. So when I said that word money, people got one of two feelings. Mm -hmm. They either felt weird and bad. It's because you Mm -hmm. were brought up without money. You were like me. You were brought up to think negative about it. Other people thought they felt good about it. It's because they were brought up hearing positive things. They were taught that money was a tool. Yeah. Money is nothing more than a tool. It's like a shovel in the the garage. So if we learn Mm -hmm. how to take back control of our money, if we learn how to use money the way the wealthy use it, but we learn how to do it for the greater good, that's the starting place. Mm. We can change a lot of things, but we can't control anything until we control the one root, the one thing, the tool that is literally at the bottom of it all, and that's money, because that's mm. how they drive this whole agenda. Yeah. It's all by money. Yeah. We'll give you a check. You know, We're going to print $5.1 trillion. We're going to hand you a check, so now you're going to vote for us. It's, mm. it's fixed. Democracy, in my opinion, is dead. And unless we mm. literally draw the line in the sand to do something to change it, man, it's not going to be pretty. It's not. 
and I can't stand it, dude. I, I'm a little guy, but I'm a scrapper. Mm -hmm. And when I hear people say, oh, this country, you know, sucks, blah, 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 then move to Ukraine and let me know how your freedom is being challenged right now. Damn this straight. is still the greatest country on earth, the yeah. land of the free and the yeah. greatest place you can possibly live, but it's going. It's gone. It's, oh, it's, it's going. It's not gone. It's, it's going not quite quick. there, but it's going. And yeah. we got to do something. And I, yeah. I, I'm i in the money space. I teach yeah. people how to take back control of their money. Mm -hmm. And I do it with things that have been around for hundreds of years, but I face haters every yeah. day. I had to make a hat that said haters need hugs too, just to make myself feel okay yeah. that I had so many haters. Yeah. Because when you start teaching people the truth, man, the truth fucking hurts. Yeah. But people need to know it. Yeah. And I teach something that is very difficult for people to comprehend because it's something that's been bastardized their whole life. Mm. They've been told lies about it and they've been told lies because they don't understand it and they just, they go, and listen, I was that person. Yeah. They think they know what they don't no. Yeah. That's it, man. And it wasn't yeah. until I was in, I was already here, Salt Lake City, Cheesecake Factory, downtown, meeting with mm -hmm. that guy, Mike, remember from my story. Yeah. And I remember asking him, he was lending me money on my real estate deals. And I said, Mike, I said, how do you lend all this money? Mm -hmm. And he le leans into me and he says, I got my own bank. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Mike, <laughs> why are we here at Cheesecake Factory? Let's uh -huh. go to your bank, dude. Yeah. I didn't know. I was like, dude, you got a bank? And he's like, no, no, no. I, I have a banking system I've created and that banking system just allows me to work and do the same things a bank does, but I don't need to own the bank. And I lean in. I'm like, dude, mm. you got to tell me more. I'm like, mm -hmm. what is this bank? Mike, mm -hmm. how do you do this? Right. He goes into it and he then comes up with the final conclusion that then I, I was that guy that thought mm. I knew what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, my bank, I learned how to do this. It's a, it's a whole life policy. And I'm just like, my man. I'm like, you son of a bitch, Mike. I'm like, <laughs> I'm an advisor. And whole life doesn't work that way, man. I'm yep. sorry, who whoever's telling you this line of crap doesn't know what yeah. they're talking about. I've been doing this 14 years, Mike. Whole life doesn't work that way. <laughs> now, Mike is very wealthy. Yeah, he leans in me, leans in me, and he says, "Dude, if it doesn't work that way, how have I been doing it?" Yeah. What was I going to say? Yeah. I sat back. I'm like, shit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Teach me, Mike. Yeah. And he said, I can't. This guy Brent showed me how to do this. So I was Didn't cha fired Chase, up. Chase Bank bought $20 billion of whole life last Dude, year. the top five banks in yeah. this country. Look it up. FDIC.gov. Okay? Yeah. Government right. website. Right. Look it up. $75 billion as of 2019 yeah. were owned by the, just the top five. You do all the banks in this country, it's over a trillion dollars. So why are a the- A trillion why dollars. Why are the banks- <laughs> That's yeah, a trillion. So a I, own a li trillion. I, I own a life insurance company. And I've been in the life insurance space for five years. That's, That's why awesome. I love what you're saying, awesome. man. This, this is, is the all truth. I do. This, this is, is the all truth. I, do. I teach a concept that was created by the late R. Nelson Nash, infinite banking concept. Infinite banking. But baby. here's the problem. Keep telling y'all. <laughs> People with infinite banking, you know what yeah. they think it is? They think it's a fucking product. They think it's the whole life. Yeah. Now, the whole life is the machine we run the money through, right. but it's not the whole life that does, it's not what, that's not what makes you wealthy. That's right. It's what the money does for you after it goes to work. Second exactly. law. Exactly. And, and we're going to get into the whole life, but. The infinite banking concept for all of you haters out there that think that you know what you don't know mm -hmm. is a process. It's yeah. a process of taking back the banking functions in your life. Let's talk about the banking functions. I'm speaking the choir here, but I'm talking to your audience Please now. do. Keep, keep you preaching. Go in, you go into a bank. What do you do? You, you work hard for the money. You take mm -hmm. that money and you go into the bank and you make a deposit. And what do they pay you? 1%. Mm -hmm. Okay. You just gave up control of your money to the bank. So does the bank take your money and put it in a little box in the back with your name on it? Hell no. no. The bank sends that money out to work for them and they make 5%. They paid you one, they make five and that's low. Yep. They made a spread of four. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the banks just by that, look it up, bankrate.com. Banks make 400 to 1300% more than we do on the money we put there. <laughs> that's right. But yeah, we keep putting money there. And they'll give you back a generous... 0.2% in your savings. That's right. And I'm, I'm being generous <laughs> and using 1% yeah. for all the haters to yeah. say, oh, no, I make more than 0.0002. Okay, right. well, you make one. You have a high-yielding savings account at 1%? Wow. Yeah, like, LI Bank, right? Wow. How did that work out yeah, for you? Nice they dropped one. those down yeah. to nothing. Anyway, I, I used to hear that all the time. Yeah. So you deposit money in the bank, and they send your money out to work for them. Mm -hmm. Genius that yeah. they convinced us that this is the path, and we yeah. don't see a problem with that. Yeah. And all I teach is, listen, you want to build wealth? You want to be in control of your money? It's as simple as changing just one thing. Mm -hmm. The money you save in the bank, let's just change where it goes first. Mm -hmm. Let's take it over here and put it into your bank. And then I always explain, now we know the cat's out of the bag. It's a whole life policy, but it's not the whole life policy that your damn broke-ass brother-in-law sold you. It's mm -hmm. specially designed and engineered. Yeah, it's We're not something you get from, like, I mean. Oh, goodness, yeah, no. No, no. And, and I didn't know this. As an advisor, all I was taught is that whole life is whole life is whole life, right? If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. But I didn't know there was different colored ducks. Mm -hmm. So we'll come to that in a second. But let's get back to the bank. They make a spread. That's how banks profit. Yeah. So now if we just change where our money goes 
And we put it into this specially designed and engineered mm -hmm. whole life policy. From mm -hmm. here on out, I'm going to call it the bank, yeah. our bank. Right. We are going to make a guaranteed interest rate plus a dividend. By today's standards, mm -hmm. 5.2 to 6% is what you can expect. Right. And that's the lowest yeah. in the last 32 years. So we can take that one and drive the stake in the ground. Yeah. You're making six okay, with, yeah. the, with a company that we both know. Yeah. So now we're making six, which is far better than the one you're making at the bank. So we're already better. That 6% is allowed to grow in an environment that is tax-free. Wow, Whoa. genius, right? <laughs> tax yes. free. And if we get sued, that money is protected against judgments and liens mm -hmm. in most states. And then if we die, that money passes on to our beneficiaries, but it's it's 10x, mm -hmm. if you will. There's a lot more. So then you think about that. If I told you all those and asked what the most perfect investment, I bet you all of those checked off on your box. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I forgot to mention liquid, literally click a button, money's yep. back in your right. account. Yeah. But then I gotta tell you what it is. Oh, yeah, and it's a whole life. Instantly, people's minds shut off. Nope, Dave Ramsey, yeah. Susie Orman said that's the worst place to put money. Yeah. Well, Dave Ramsey clearly has no idea what we do because he did right. a video saying the infinite banking concept's a scam, and he got everything wrong in the video. The only thing he got right, and I think this is wise, he said, dividends, those dividends are just a return of unpaid premiums. Dude, you stupid motherfucker. Yeah. Excuse my language. Say it. You are so stupid. You're trying to brainwash people to say mm. that that's a bad thing. That's brilliant. You know who came up with that? The dudes that created the tax code. Instead of calling the dividend that the mutually owned insurance company pays you a dividend that you have to pay tax on, let's just call it a return of unused premiums. Mm -hmm. A business, when they invest money, whatever's left over that didn't get, you know, whatever's left over from what they make and what they spend, isn't that the unused money? It's the same damn thing. But one's taxed, <laughs> one's not. So stupid that people want to like highlight that. Yeah. Of course, it's a return of premiums. The yeah. company didn't spend it, so it's. You mean oh, there's extra money. <laughs> oh, but if we call it a profit, you're going to pay tax. So right. do you want to have it tax free, or do you want to pay tax? Yeah. So now it's tax free. Listen, like the people, if banks are the number one purchasers of this, and your audience can look it up, Bully, B O L I, but bank owned life insurance. Look at how much money they have. But yeah, if you go to the bank advisor, your premier advisor, if you reach that level, and you say, hey, listen. I've got $10 million. I'm just making numbers up. And all I want you to do, and they're salivating already. Mm -hmm. That advisor's got this grin. He's, he's you know, pulling it back. Is I want you to put my money the exact same place the bank puts its money. Mm -hmm. Sit back and shut up. They can't do it. Yeah. They won't do it. Mm -hmm. So we put our money in this machine mm -hmm. that the wealthiest individuals in this country have done because they've created this little, this little environment. Yeah. But now let's get to the math, okay? If I'm making six... And I want to invest money. Let's say you bring me an opportunity, Jer Jeremiah, and that opportunity is going to pay me, what's a good return right now? 12? Sure. You're going to pay me 12%. So I'm making six, and I want to put money into that. Mm -hmm. So all I do is I click a button, and that money then, is a, it's a loan, is loaned to me, and it goes into my bank account, and I give it to you. You're going to pay me 12. The insurance company never touched my money. Mm -hmm. So let's just say it's, I don't know, let's call it 100,000 bucks that I'm going to give you. My 100 grand never left, but I just gave you. A mm -hmm. hundred grand. Right. You Whose didn't. money did I give you? Not mine. Yep. That's gave right. you the insurance company's That's money. right. Because the insurance company promised me two things. It guaranteed me two things. A guaranteed interest rate and a death benefit upon my death. What they never seem to tell people is that we can use that death benefit while we're living. Mm -hmm. The insurance company will gladly loan that money to us anytime we want without any questions. And all they're going to do is charge us an interest rate on that. A simple interest rate. Mm -hmm. So my hundred grand's in my account earning compound interest. Mm -hmm. Well, I take the 100 grand and I give it to you, and they're going to charge me simple interest of four. I'm making six compound interest, paying four. Am I not making a spread just like the good old fancy banks? That's mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. But you see, my spread goes up every single year because mm -hmm. of compounding. Mm -hmm. People need to understand that. Albert Einstein said, those that understand it earn it. We earn it. Yeah. Those that don't pay it. Most right. of those 95%. Eighth wonder of the world, baby. Right. But the best part is, is not only do I get a raise every year because my spread goes up every year. Right. I just found the way to make money twice on the same dollar. Mm -hmm. My money's earning compound interest. I'm making a spread. Mm -hmm. You're paying me 12%. So I just made money twice. When yeah. everybody else out there that invested with you made money once. Yeah. And all I did is change one thing. Dude, this is what I teach. Mm -hmm. This is what I face a lot of grief and stress and everything else because people just don't want to believe this is real. They say, oh, it's too good to be true. There's no way that it exists. 16 years, the high-level advisor. How many times do you think those assholes taught me this? Mm -hmm. Zero. Zero. You already know the answer. Yeah. Zero. Do you yeah. know why? Kill, kill their business. It killed their business. Kill Wall Street. That's right. It killed Wall Street, but it also killed their business because the hardest thing for any financial firm is to keep advisors employed because it's a commission business in most cases. So you, whatever you kill is what you eat. Mm -hmm. 
And the commissions are really high in a traditional regular whole life. 10 grand pays the advisor a minimum of 5,500. If we put money into this specially designed and engineered whole life, how much does it pay us? Well, the company I just mentioned pays me $387. 5,500 or 387? Mm -hmm. Which would you prefer? Yeah. Of course you'd want the 55, but who suffers? Yeah. My client. Mm. Remember I mentioned the mm -hmm. fifth law of wealth? Mm -hmm. Give. Yeah. Give unconditionally. Mm -hmm. By me building the plan so that it pays me a lot less, up to 90% less, mm -hmm. my clients have 90% more. Somebody has to give for somebody else to get. It's the secret to life. It's yeah, a law. Right. I just participate in it. And I do it in a way that allows my clients to build their own banking systems, take back control of their money, do the same thing the wealthy do, but yet get ahead in life in a very fast way. Because making money twice is always better than making money once. Mm -hmm. This is the number one thing I teach. And then I've just created another company that fulfills on the back end. Because the infinite banking concept is not about the money. I mean, if you put money in a whole life to make 6%, like you're not going to get wealthy. It's better than the bank, but you're not going to get wealthy. Right. But if you then move that money out in investments and in lending and things, mm -hmm. that's where you make your money. But those are limited. And if you're not in the know or in the right network, those are hard to find. Mm -hmm. So I remember back to when I was a, a, pro, a pro snowboarder. Now, your audience might dislike something I'm going to say here, but that's okay. I'm going to be raw. I was always single mm -hmm. as, an, as a, a pro snowboarder. Smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. But when I travel out, I'm from Buffalo. If I'm going to Salt Lake City, one thing I wanted is I wanted a date. I mm -hmm. wanted someone to hang out with after the contest to celebrate if mm -hmm. I won or even if I lost. So back then, there was dating sites too, just like there is today. Right. And I liked eHarmony. And I would go on to eHarmony and I'd look at all the profiles, pick the one I liked, and I'd message them. And eventually you'd find somebody that would hang out with you the night you got there. Mm -hmm. It was perfect. Two people, a community. I paid a membership and I, I, my problem was solved. Mm -hmm. I started to think about that when I started to have money and I wanted to make my money go to work. And it was hard. Mm -hmm. So why isn't there a dating site for money? Mm. That's all I did, man. Yeah. I solved the problem. Right. It was my problem at first. And that problem started with just... Like I, I did it on Slack. I basically created this thing on Slack and I just invited people in and we just started lending to them. Friends of mine would come in and they'd say, hey, can I jump in on this deal? Sure. Mm -hmm. So then that's evolved. It's been two years of beta testing mm -hmm. and I have created the dating site for money and it's called Private Money Club. Mm -hmm. And it is literally that. It's like Tinder for money. <laughs> if you got money, there's only two types of people. There's people that have money that want to yeah. make money and people that need money to make money. Right. I just created the place where they both communicate. Mm -hmm. And this launch now you mentioned this is launching very soon, right? You've gone through two phases of beta testing, right? You can literally swipe right and swipe left on That's it. Yes. On, on lenders and just business potential business partners, which is genius. I fucking love it. When does this <laughs> when does this launch again? October fourteenth at a theater near you. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Right around the corner, Sundance Resort, one of my favorite resorts, the yeah. old Robert Redford thing. We've literally rented that place out and we're building the craziest stage and lighting, and we are gonna do the most epic launch. I like to think, listen, I'm a dreamer, yeah. and I think big. Mm -hmm. And I am in, I'm fascinated with the way Steve Jobs launched products. And I always mm -hmm. go back to the Mac. I'm going to do the same thing because this problem I'm solving isn't just lending for real estate. I'm going to change the way money is worked and used mm -hmm. for everything in the future. Mm -hmm. Mark my word. Hey, listen, if Bezos can start by selling books online and then turn into what he does today where he sells everything, why can't I change the way that money works? I may end up floating face down down some river because I <laughs> – Put, you know, I gave people right. an option that they don't need banks, but hey, sometimes we got to make the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it goes back to that sixth law. Yeah. It's the legacy we create. Mm. I want to be remembered for changing something mm. big. Now it's called Private Lending Club? Private Money Club. Private Money Club. Private yeah. Money Club. That's going to be an it's app. Really, it's, it's not software. lending. It's just private money. Right. Private Money Club. I love it. That's awesome. October 14th, it goes live. It's an app you can download. Yep. iOS, everything. Everything. Yeah, Fuck dude. Yeah. Like, I spent a lot of money developing. You know uh, what yeah. it's like to build software. I do, I've been, yeah. I've been at this a long time. Crazy. And I've got hundreds invested just in the yeah. development of it. It's epic. I mean, yeah. we've already run $20 million through the platform in beta with about 163 paid members right now. Jeez. So when we launch, this is gonna this is gonna be badass. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. so excited. Man. I am too. I, I wish you were in town. I I just have your you know have you right over. Have you have you part of the entire? I'll thing. let you know if the hunt gets moved because I got a hunt out in Texas that uh, we we paid for. So I can't wait for that. But if it gets moved, I will text you because I'd love That's to be awesome. there. I'd love to have you. Uh, appreciate it. Well, dude, man, this has been a fire podcast. Like we could everything you just talk about. Like we could talk about this stuff for hours, man. And I I know for a fact a lot of the audience needs to hear more of that. So what's the best place people can get a hold of you, man? It's easy. Just go to chrisnoggle.com. And remember, I said I watched. Watched a 90-minute video. That's what Mike told me to do. Watch a 90-minute video. 
a 90 minute video will pop up that mm. will teach you how to be your own bank. I urge everybody listening to this to watch that video Love it. and that'll teach you the path. So that's the, that's where all the resources are. Love it. Chris mm-hmm. We'll link all this in the bottom to your social media on Instagram at the Chris Noggle on we'll every be. single channel. You Love can it. Give. Oh, perfect. That's I'm easy. I'm a giver, enough. man. I give Love so it. much free content. But hey, no, this has been great, dude. A lot of fucking value provided today. Dude, it's been good to get to know you, brother. Thanks for coming on the bullpen. It's been an honor.